Hello, everybody. My name is Pablo Bochkowski. I'm a faculty member at Northwestern University and the director of the Center for Latinx Digital Media. Thank you so much for joining us for today's weekly virtual seminar of the Center. It is really a pleasure to have you with us. The mission of the Center is to create knowledge about digital media in Latinx and Latin American communities across the Americas. Today's speaker is a leading scholar in this space. Matias Rodel is an associate professor at Universidad Católica de Uruguay. Facundo Suenzo, a doctoral student at Northwestern University and an affiliate at the Center for Latinx Digital Media, will introduce Matias in just a second. I am delighted to note that this quarter, our series is co-sponsored by the Alice Kaplan Institute for the Humanities, the Buffett Institute for Global Affairs, the Center for Global Culture and Communication, the Department of Communication Studies, the Department of Radio, Television and Film, the Latina and Latino Studies Program, and the Program in Latin American and Caribbean Studies. But before we go into the seminar, I would like to start by acknowledging that Northwestern is a community of learners situated within a network of historical and contemporary relationships with Native American tribes, communities, parents, students, and alumni. It is also in close proximity to an urban Native American community in Chicago and near several tribes in the Midwest. The Northwestern campus sits on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Orawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. It was also a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. It is within Northwestern's responsibility as an academic institution to disseminate knowledge about native peoples and the institution's history with them. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity and inclusion, Northwestern works towards building relationships with Native American communities through academic pursuits, partnerships, historical recognitions, community service, and enrollment efforts. Let me briefly say a little bit more about how the seminar will unfold. In just a minute, Facundo will tell us more about Matias' research and career. Then Matias will deliver his seminar. After that, we will open for questions. Please enter your questions at any point in time in the seminar or during the Q&A in the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom of the screen. Facundo will moderate. At the end, we will deliver some closing remarks. Once again, many thanks for joining us. And without further ado, Facundo, the screen is all yours. Thank you uh, very much, Pablo, and hello, everyone. I'm incredibly honored uh, to have been invited uh, to today's seminar to introduce Professor Matias Dodo and to co-moderate this very promising presentation at the Center uh, for Latinx Digital Media. Professor Dodo is Associate Professor in the Department of Social Science at Universidad Católica Uruguay, where he coordinates the World Internet Project, Distop Project, and Kids Online Uruguayan Chapters. Matias Dodo has a degree in psychology from Universidad de la República and a degree in sociology from Universidad Católica Uruguay, a master in sociology from Universidad de la República, and he then obtained a PhD in sociology from University of Haifa, Israel. Uh, he has worked as an independent consultant for international and national organizations, uh, such as the National E-Government and Information Society Agency, of the Uruguayan government presidency, where he developed official service on information and communication technology in collaboration with the National Statistics Office. Dr. Dodo specializes in information society, public policy, digital inequalities, and cyber safety. He has authored several books, chapters, and an extensive selection of journal articles in prestigious venues, such as uh, Global Studies of Childhood, Journal of Children and Media, and information, communication, and society, among others. In one of his latest contributions to the field, Dr. Dodo, uh, with other colleagues, explored cyber and traditional bullying experiences on adolescents in Chile. Based on different sociodemographic and behavioral clusters, the study highlights the heterogeneity and the complexity of both traditional and cyberbullying, and the need to tailor interventions to diverse types of victims. Please join me in welcoming Professor Matias Dodel. Hello to everyone. I'm really honored to be part of this uh, virtual seminar series of Latinx uh, 
digital media. And I will be presenting you uh, some of the findings of uh, part of our studies regarding, uh, so here, okay. Uh, one minute. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will be trying to to discuss with you and, and present you some of the findings of our part of the, our studies concerning the Kids Online Latin America network and uh, service across the continent. But we'll try to to focus on on one specific uh, article we published recently with Nicolas Trachtemer and, and Pablo Menese that it's concerning uh, social interactions with previously unknown people on the internet by children and adolescents. And the title is, is kind of try to go away from the stranger uh, word. The idea is that uh, not every stranger means danger. And this is just the, the, uh, the an image of, of the article. It's published in Global Studies of Childhood. And what I want to talk about in this presentation, there are several things. First, if we are going to study anything regarding how digital media affects well-being or development, they tend to be my, the focus of my research. We need to, to be really focused on the dependent variable, not the independent variable. In this case, digital media or ICT is the independent variable. So we need to understand and focus on childhood and adolescence. And we will also discuss that as a process like uh, of progressive autonomy, childhood involves in inner intentions between safety and autonomy. Uh, but then digital media enters into the, into the arena. And the thing is, we also discuss what happens when children's social lives are digitally mediated almost by default. Uh, and also this idea that contact with new people I prefer, we use another like more scholarly term than strangers, people with weak or non pre existing ties. There are hidden issues like for parents, policymakers in the media. Uh, the thing is, they're almost usually driven by moral panics and seldom by, by evidence. I think the worst thing that we do is we don't ask children and adolescents what happens in the social, in the digital mediated social life. And this is one of the, I think, the biggest advantages of the Global Kids Online project and, and studies. Then we, I will try to present you why Global Kids Online, how, what is Global Kids Online and how we study these kids' reactions to online friendship requests. Also discuss part of the model, like the idea that there are risks and benefits in the rent for, of taking part in the digital world, but risks and harms are not like a pair, they can be differentiated. And finally, and the, the more empirical part of the presentation is the, this UYN case or paper, this someone wants to connect with you, and uh, trying to, um, a small model of trying to predict responses to online friendship requests based on several things that we have already discussed. I think, I, I hope to be, or have already discussed in the presentation, some CMC, computer mediated communication theory, uh, social issue inequalities coming from the digital framework and some psychosocial predictors of internet risky behaviors would be the, the key independent variables. Okay, so first, childhood and adolescents are not only a, like minefield of harms and risks and they are not only internet related. There are critical periods for human development and this should be the focus. It's, it must be the focus of any kind of study or intervention we're trying to, to make or address concerning childhood. So in this kind of, in this sense, we, we need to understand that childhood and adolescence are transition, sorry, transition to adulthood is a, uh, a breaking, it's a period of breaking uh, dependence with guardians in terms of safety and effect towards a progressive, uh, path of growth of psychological, uh, psychosocial autonomy. So uh, in this sense also social life, meeting with new people, it's not bad per se. On the contrary, it's really critical for uh, like an adequate like psychological well-being. And there is a lot of like 
is like coming from outside digital media studies, like Brown and other people that psych mostly psycholo psychologists or psych social psychologists that study like adolescents and childhood. In this context, relationship with peers play a, crit play a critical role serving to like as the basis of emotional, social and cognitive growth. This may seem obvious, but the literature focusing on online risks on children and adolescents tend to forget this kind of, of setting. So this is Little Red Riding Hood, Caperucita Roja will be part of the, of the presentation. So even if this period is critical for, for like development, meeting with new people, stranger or not, or not so stranger and depends on, on the perception, is generally seen as a really dangerous uh, situation and not a lot of studies focus on the positive aspects. This is in Spanish, I would translate to English. When I present in Spanish, I do. The other thing, but this is a fragment of the, an article that a science journalist developed based on this, on, on this paper that I showed you recently. It was a really good experience. He actually read the paper and translated it to a non-scholar non or academic audience. So he came up with this idea of little writing hood that that's not mine, but I think it's really, really, a really good idea, a metaphor for this issue. And he said that the story goes like this, that Caperucita Roja, Little Red Riding Hood, goes to the forest, like in a way to their, her grandmother's house. And in the way, a stranger, uh, the wolf, tricks her in order to eat her. And even if times are not the same and we are new times, almost anyone goes to the forest to walk to her, grand, her grandma and give her like a cest, and you know, cesta in English of, of food. Uh, and there are not a lot of wild animals in, in the cities. Our kids, uh, adolescents, they still go to other roads or like forest-like scenarios. In, this, in, in our time, this forest is changed by like the internet or the digital world, social media platforms and online games. I think we should, uh, if we frame this problem in the little Red Riding Hood trope, it's, I think it's really similar. But the thing is, this forest, as I, as I told you, is uh, it's like the internet, ICT became a key component in children's social lives, more so than in adults, like interactions are more digital mediated compared to adults. The thing is, even if before speaking about the risk, we need to, to speak about why this is happening. And there are obviously some benefits, uh, like using like CMC or computer mediated communication instead of face to face has certain advantages for children and adolescents, also for adults. Uh, first, it may enrich the, 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 diver and the diversity of their like offline social world, more so in, like, in households or cultures where they're more conservative or isolated. Uh, but also the truth is there's like, this is part of the kids online framework, like benefits, benefits and risk of the internet use go hand in hand. But how, how do we work with this? The idea is that we need to foster children's potentials online while also giving the, them the tools to, to cope with risk and minimize harm. Like if you are exposed to risk, it doesn't mean that you, you actually are harmed if you have the added, perhaps a, some a sets of tools on, or capabilities. However, and this is when we go to like, to like more empirical studies, online risk related to stranger contact or like social contact had not higher, or at least there's no evidence that they're higher than offline related social contact risks. There are some studies uh, from communications, criminology, sociology. There is not a lot of evidence that these things are high, these risks are higher online than offline. It may seem counterintuitive because we live mostly online, but when you go to victimization service or, or even qualitative studies or bullying, cyberbullying or stranger related contacts, they are not higher per se. The thing is, even if parents or policymakers don't like this, like life nowadays will inevitably, inevitably, sorry, include interactions with people, and this is a term I prefer to use, that have weak or non pre existent ties. In a more social network, social network analysis way of, of framing these this issues. 
And the thing is, these interactions, if we take the, the word stranger from, from this interaction, they are not, they tend to be neutral or even positive for development, but the issue is that they are perceived to be risky by default. This is a term that is used by some of the, there are not a lot of studies on this, but, but most of the studies use this idea. They're, they're risky by default, and this is problematic in terms of welfare. The idea is that, yes, safety should be a concern for everyone. And it's a priority in, in, for our kids, uh, like an adolescents, for children as a whole. But these interactions with people with weaker or non persistent ties need to be contextualized in this idea of childhood as a whole and life course perspective. Okay, so the question perhaps would be why kids meet new people online? And as I told you, not only like, uh, like from an adult perspective, but from the kids perspective, online interactions with strangers can be really positive for them. Strangers or then less sorry, people with that that are privately as unknown in a face-to-face -face setting. Okay, so people study adolescents also say that uh, CMC computer mediated communication presents opportunities to enhance uh, children's social so psychological lives. For example, CMC allows to a higher degree of controllability of what you say or how you behave, and this is good for practicing social skills perhaps more so for people who are timid or introverted. Uh, also making new friends is kind of, as a whole, but also for people who are more uh, introverted. Uh, and when older, and we need to be realistic, and if you go to any like service or studies on the beginning of, social, of sexual life for adolescents, they don't start at 18, they start slightly earlier. And in some kinds to finding a romantic or sexual partner are also some of the things that seems you are used to. For example, there's a study, I think it's where the, for, by the Pew Research Center in 2014, that more than half of US teens say that they met a new friend online and social media sites, social network sites, and online gameplay were the most common digital channels to find new friends as a whole. Okay, the thing is that contacting strangers online or even making the next step going to a face-to-face -face contact can also have another like possible uh, sensible motives that go besides what I already told you. For example, if they are buying or selling things, if they are school tutoring among peers or in play, playing video games. As I told you, it's not risky by default. Nonetheless, and this is really important, while whereas not every stranger means danger, there are still strangers that are ill-intentioned and we need to take this into account. And Perhaps I should have started with this in the presentation, but in the paper we do. This is not to ridicule genuine parental concerns regarding ill intention individuals online. There are these people, uh, they exist almost everywhere, but the thing is that their prevalence may be different than the share of news they have in the media or share of concerns regarding parents. And this, I also want to be clear, having small children being contacted by strangers, people with no, no, no not, not ties or not pre-existing ties, is not a desired outcome. And this, this is, I think we all agree on this, but also isolating like twins or adolescents is also a really bad outcome in terms of well-being and public policy. And I think one of the key concepts that we need to always embed in public policies on this population, on these populations, is progressive autonomy. It's not the same like a five-year-old, a nine-year-old, a thirteen-year-old, and a seventeen-year-old regarding what they do online and what they seek online. Also, we need to take into consideration that some of the moral panics that we discuss are really gender. For example, Little Red Riding Hood is is a girl, and this is not casual, moral panics and like really restrictive parental mediation tends to be focused more on girls than, than boys, as also in smaller children than in older children. And there are other things that are not so intuitive. For example, having digital skills or being digital competent, while it's really critical for, for 21st or digital citizenship, there are several studies that also state that 
the more skills you have, the more risk you tend to take online. So this is counterintuitive, but the idea is that if you only have digital skills, but no social skills, or this idea of several digital citizenship frameworks, to talk about netiquette or like how to behave online, they could, could be, they would have undesired outcomes. In Spanish, I, when I teach, there are several students of mine here, I, I call this the, the hypothesis of the, mon, the monkey with the machine gun. You give, if you give the tools, but not other tools on how to behave on how to like to be socially smart, it can be dangerous. And also there are coming more from the criminological fields, people studying self-control. If certain psychological traits more than anything related to like low self-control and also having other kind of problematic offline behaviors, they are related with taking more risk online. And even if all what I said before, accepting like friendship from everyone that sends you a request or adding people online without any kind of judgment is a, a risky behavior. And we need to take into account this to, to discuss a friendship request with strangers. Okay, so, but how kids meet new people online? This is, we talk about why, but how? The thing is, there are, aren't a lot of studies on this. There is uh, like a, a growing literature, but try to, to find like scholar articles in this. And there, regrettably, there aren't a lot. And what, but what we know, most of them are, some of them are from the Kids Online framework. I, I will, after this slide, I will discuss uh, Kids Online. We have evidence when we ask kids what they do online, that there are not like passive users and that incapable of like developing or creating strategies to cope with unpleasant situations or, or harms online. They actually think about what they do online. They might have less or, or more conscience about this, but they actually like, there are not dumb actors online. This is, we have a lot of evidence on this. Uh, and also when you, when you talk about this, this, this fear of transient danger, when you kind of like analyze and describe all the, the steps required to go from like a stranger that contacts you online to face-to-face -face meeting, there are several steps. And this is, I think that the best paper on this is Chernikov et al. She, she, they, sorry, there's a lot of people. They do like several, like, like close to hundred interviews with focus groups with European uh, adolescents. And the, like the potential danger of a contact can be stopped at any time in this process. It's a, like a long process. In this presentation, I will focus only on the, the first stage, the initial contact made by the stranger or by kids, but mostly by, by the, sorry, not stranger, people with weaker or not pre-existing ties. Okay, so we focus on this. In this sense, friendship requests or messages are the main or most frequent way in which contact is initiated in being like known or unknown people in European adolescents. We don't have data for, I think, Latin American ones, but it, I think it's good to assume, it's okay to assume that it's the same. And for example, in the US, the same study by Pew Research in 2014, 32% of online, of adolescents that were uh, used teens who were online were contacted by someone that they, they didn't previously know. And when we, when we actually listen to them and hear the responses, most of them ignore or delay the invitation, more than like two thirds, and are close to 10% reply, but to be asked to be left alone. And the other 21% ask for more information about the person. It doesn't mean that they actually ended up meeting the stranger online, offline or online. But when we go back to Chernikova's uh, study, they, they try to assess what kind of responses children make, and in, in, in a broad term, there are three kinds of responses. Children or adolescents, sorry, who automatically dismiss almost by default the, the request, perceiving like the, these actors as a negative or dangerous by default. There are other, other set of kids that do some kind of effort to evaluate stra the stranger before replying, and the paper is really good on like pointing out, like making a list of what things children use 
to, to make this evaluation. For example, similar last name, because they can be family or they are friends, they are friends with them and so on. This is really interesting. I recommend this paper, but also there are other cases, and this is perhaps the riskier ones, that they automatically accept any kind of request. And what they say is this in their study, these people, they had more hedonistic related motives. They wanted to be more popular on to, or to gain more friends in a game to have more rewards or, or to have more social media presence. They were a minority, but their motives tend to be more hedonistic related. Okay, so I think one of the most interesting questions in this, in, in this setting of a Latinx uh, digital media is how kids meet new people online in Latin America. So the first thing that you need to know is there's substantially this evidence that in the global north, that's nothing to be surprised of. Uh, in, in most cases, there is just to make you some like a short timeline before 2016, 2015, there were no like national representative studies. I think almost no studies at all that actually listened to children and adolescents or what they did online. We're talking like uh, six years, like th there were six years from now, but there were no studies. It, I think it's kind of problematic because a lot of policies were, were being discussed or made and lots of talks were being done online, also by Latin uh, researchers and, and and media figures, to say at least. I had some experience meeting them in other seminars and they're not, they are not always based on evidence. So I think you, you, we can like make this beginning of this idea of Kids Online Latin America in Brazil in 2015, 2014. It's kind of an offspring of another project, AU Kids Online, that actually followed a lot into global Kids Online. I will talk about this framework. In Latin America, it started with Brazil, then Chile, then Uruguay, Costa Rica, last year, Dominican Republic. And we are planning to, to have more partners. Colombia is uh, going to the park. Argentina, this same kind a, a different version of this, only for adolescents. These tend to be studies from children from 19, so, sorry, from nine to 17 years old. Um, and in the Latin American network, we use the same framework similar, like the same core questions and similar questions, but each country has like its national representative or at least your one representative. Everyone has different similar methods, but we have diverse governances and objectives. Uh, we shift slightly to this, the same framework. Global Kids Online is based on AU Kids Online. It's a project that was started by LSE. I think the, the most prominent figure in this project and line of studies is Sonia Livingston. And this framework, I use it a lot when in my classes, in my undergraduate classes and, and graduate classes. I think it's really useful to try to understand how anything impacts in children's well-being and rights. And this is the dependent variable. Everything else is part of a, a set or a cluster of independent variables. And there are lots of things that affect the way, the way children are impacted by the internet. I won't discuss everything, but like in the sky blue or blue square are more like traditional things that uh, people study social digital inequalities assess, but there are also people will be in is affected by the family, educators, peers, community, and digital ecology. I think we should understand digital ecology as a, the platforms or the spaces in which they experience the digital life. This is a, the part we, we need to negotiate with uh, corporations, uh, I mean, but also the country level. Each country has different things, the level of social, societal inclusion, societal inclusion, equality, welfare, technology provision and regulation. I would talk about Uruguay. We have a, like an all APC, actually successful program at a country implemented countrywide. Also the level of uh, education and knowledge. I think uh, Uruguay is a, it's not a really good example. Of, we have a lot of education inequality, but also culture, media and values, for example, we have a lot of variance in sexual, sexual content related mediation across the globe, more conservative or more uh, liberal societies. And this is a really good, I think, framework to assess how, to assess this idea of the, how child well-being and rights are affected by the internet. So besides this study, I will go back to the, the idea, but 
in Latin America, this Latin American project, we have at least a common set of professional goals. First, we actually, it's a must to conduct national representative studies, samples, because there are a lot. In some countries, there are no information, there is no information about what, what children do online with a relative like quality study. But also, we also complement this with quality, qualitative studies because we want to put this, we want to put what children's voices in the agenda, but also we are working towards translating these findings into useful and actionable, inform actionable information for national, like government, local, I think not only local, regional, but schools and household policymakers, teachers and parents. I believe that are, they are some of the critical, the, the, the key policymakers in, in these kind of issues. Okay, so one step further. How kids meet new people online in Latin America? As I told you, not every question is common and some countries ask different questions and others. In this case, in this case, Chile, Brazil, and Costa Rica ask the same question. You see there are different years, so the context is different. Internet is slightly different in Chile uh, 2016 and in Costa Rica 2018. Also Chile had a higher share of internet access than Costa Rica and Brazil is different and Brazil this is like how frequent were were how frequently do you add people to my friend or contact list that I never met face to face? In Brazil, it's never or sometimes in or never yes or no is dummy. And in Chile and Costa Rica is a, a frequency scale, a liquor scale. But as a whole, I want you to show that almost 80% of all children say that they never or almost never add people added people to my friend or contact list I never met before. The way Chile, Brazil, and Costa Rica ask the question doesn't allow us to, to, to assess if the children initiated, initiated the contact or they were initiated, initiated by a third party. But we see that even in different, different socioeconomical contexts and time periods, this is like the most prevalent behavior in kids is being relatively, like acting relatively sounded or safe. In, other two really different contexts. This is Dominican Republic during the pandemic and Uruguay in 2016, like five, four or five years before the pandemic. We ask another question is, how do you usually respond to requests from people that ask to become your friend online? And there were four response categories. They are ordered in terms of the strength of the ties. And in this case, this is with the same variable I will discuss uh, afterwards, but it's the, the the darker one, the darker blue one is, I say that yes, only if I know them very well and towards lighter ones, only if I know them, only if I have friend, friends in common and I usually accept all requests. Going to like to the right of the, of the slide, you see that in Costa Rica is 3% and in Uruguay is 5% among the all children, the ones that I accept, usually accept all requests. And it's higher than 80%, the ones that say that only accepts people if they know them or if they know them very well. I think this is important to, to understand. So going to, uh, to the next slide and dealing into the, the paper per se, uh, what are the sample and methods of this, of this study? Um, first, I don't think, I, I am not seeing the, the audience here. I think that there are most Uruguayans. So this is probably, it's not, it's not relevant, but in the States, whenever I, I'm, I went there and say, I, I was from Uruguay, they said Africa, no. I said Latin America, oh, Paraguay, no, Uruguay. Are for Latin Americans, there are a lot of Argentinians in the, in the team of the uh, Latin Digital Media Center. When a Uruguayan speaks, uh, we are always uh, confused to Argentinians, particularly to, to Porteños, to people from Buenos Aires. So slight dish as a, a, a small shock. We are not Paraguay, we are not Argentina. Uruguay has a set of characteristics in the context of Latin America that are kind of interesting, not for this paper, but as I told you, we develop a plan Ceibal, a national level, more than world all PC program, device and software and internet provision. This is important in the context of what we wanted to study in Kids Online. But for this study and this paper, just I wanted, I wanted to, to tell you some things about this, the, the survey, Kids Online survey. 
we interview uh, close to one, 1K uh, households. It has national representative survey of households with children from 19 to 17 years old living in private households from rural localities. Uruguay is a really, from urban localities. Uruguay is a really urban country. More than 95% of the population lives uh, in urban localities. And also we are small. So our definition of urban may be like rural in other countries, but more than 5K people in a, in a town, that's urban for us. Okay, it was, uh, the survey was made by, by CAPI, Computer Assisted Personal Interviews, uh, at, at the children's household. This is before the pandemic. And we have a, a, special, a team specially trained to conduct service to children. Plan Seibal was in charge of the, of the, of the field with UNICEF. Uh, along a child, a parent or guardian was also interviewed to collect two types of data, SES, social economic status and related data from the household, but also parental mediation information. We asked the children what their parents did, but their parents did, but also we asked one of the guardians what they did to, to mediate the use of internet from the children. So regarding this study, this study itself, the dependent variable is the same variable I showed you in the slide before, responses to online friendship requests. In this case, responses were ordered accord, according to the strength of the ties between the respondent and the requester. So it goes from stranger or non-existing ties, accepting behaviors to reluctancy to engage uh, with, no con with contacts that are not well known by the child. In this sense, the uh, an ordinal logistic regression was the, the most adequate technique to, to uh, fit our model. And also as we, in Uruguay, we only ask this question to children who said that they had any type of social media account. So we have a potential selection bias. So we use a selectivity correction term. I won't discuss this here, but just you won't see the paper there is uh, this explained detail. And also I think, the most interesting result is um, we also conducted some simulations on the probabilities of, accept of accepted French requests based on first age groups, because age was a critical variable, but also uh, as we, we created some higher and low risk profiles uh, based on our model. I won't focus a lot on, on the model, uh, sorry, the hypothesis before the model. As I tried to present you, there are at least five things that in the literature there are kind of uh, previous uh, persistent evidence that they are relevant. First, age. Older children tend to accept more friendship from individuals with weaker ties. Not only strangers with weaker ties, they tend to also expand more the social the social circle online. Girls, because of gender like norms, tend to accept less less friendly friendship uh, from individuals with weaker or non persistent ties. Digital skills. The higher the digital skills the higher the chance uh, of accepting friendship like this. And also if there were previous uh, like offline risky behaviors, they would correlate with riskier online behaviors and understanding like stranger related contacts as, as kind of a uh, risky behavior, they will also be higher. And finally, people who have like, who reported having problems self-regulating their internet use as a proxy of low self-control, we also predict that they are we have more chances to accepting friendship requests from people with non pre existing ties. This is an awful way to present the model, but it's the only one. Just to see, almost all all our hypotheses are statistically significant, and the pseudo R square increases, uh, which like introduction of each uh, of set of hypotheses. The only thing that was not statistically significant that we use as, as control is uh, socioeconomic status. The age increases risk of responses, gender reduces it, digital skills increase, previous risk offline and excessive use of the internet also increases. We tested like for all the uh, supuestos, I would say, of uh, like that the, this logistic model did not violate the power regression assumption when data was weighted. And we also tested some interactions that are not presented here, but they were not statistical significant. It's a really small and clean model but that's the point we wanted to make a small and clean argument. So this is the simulation of the estimated probabilities of, of accepting French requests according to age and risk profiles. These percentages are the, the probabilities of each of these responses. And we have three values of age, nine to 12, 
13 to 15 and 16 to 17. This also correlate with like the school, the end of like primary school, of middle school, and, and the last part, ciclo, ciclo basico is middle school, and high school as a whole, that's bachillerato. And we created two profiles to, to use in the simulation, a really low, the lowest risk profile being female with low level of digital skills, no flying risk behaviors, no history, and no history of problems as a consequence of internet use, and the highest risk profile, male, high digital skills, offline risk behavior, and a problem so as a consequence of internet use. As you see in the lower risk profiles, there's almost no uh, acceptance of friendship, re friendships request from anyone, neither from if they have any friends in common, so friends of a friend, but as age increases, like between the two more safety or close responses, as age increase, the, the safe, the, like the, the more isolated behavior, accepting only if they know very well, decreases and increases the accept if they know them. On the highest risk profile, I, I think we need to focus on three things. First, the, the, more, the more prevalent response at any age, even in the highest risk profile, is accepting friends if they know them. They don't accept anyone. The response category that's almost non-existent is accepting if they know them very well, the, the, the requester. And there, is, there are some like close to 30 regarding accepting friends from friends and between 10 to 20 accepting anyone. This increases with age. But I think we should focus on the like, if you want to assess the riskier, the, the more, the risk, riskiest behavior, I think it's on children from nine to 12 that accept everyone. It doesn't matter if they know of, of their, or they don't know. This is close to 20%. The probability of these kids of accepting this is close to 20%. It's not small. I think perhaps if you, need, if you want to focus some public policies on this, this is the, the kind of population we need to, to do. And also perhaps all the yellow responses are problematic. So discussing this, the findings of the article. First, contrary on, on the presentation, contrary to, to moral panics, the most prevalent type of response across the continent, I think across all uh, kids online studies, Europe and Asia and Africa, is that accepting friends requests only for individuals if they know them very well or if, if they know them. But difference in responses are significantly impacted by the things that we predicted, perhaps by other things that we didn't include in the model, for example, parental mediation. And okay, so you might say, okay, it, it, it's better for uh, women are like girls are safer because they don't uh, they don't have a, like risky response. This is like really good. No, it's not really good because we know by because of the theory and our studies that this low lower risk based gender uh, trend responses are the product of fear. It's not that they are less vulnerable. They are more vulnerable. I think we need to try to create policies on this subject, really considering like moral panics are these tropes about the strange and danger around little girls. Also, uh, okay, uh, and this, this criminological literature actually states that these are these gender norms are derived from paternalistic responses and also for a greater sense of vulnerability by, by girls. The other thing is as children grow older, they incrementally accept like more requests from weaker ties. This is not bad per se, but in the case of smaller children, I think that uh, this clearly entrails a clear risk and we need to, to, to try to at least focus on this population, but age is a critically a critical variable for this kind of policies uh, on, on the like on the smaller children on the small children because they they may lack the social skills not only the digital ones but the social skills and psychological like maturity to to correctly assess this non this new people and also to they may not have the skills to cope with riskier situations. As I told you, there are the basis of the 21st uh, skill, 21st uh, digital uh, citizenship, citizenship, but there are some risks and we need to take into account that skills and competences online need to be accompanied by like social emotional or social skills. 
However, if we aim to make children only accept people that they know, we will also damage or harm other children. If you only accept people from your social circle, if you are born in a social circle really like conservative or like you don't have a lot of friends, it will uh, hinder your, your potential well-being. And I think we need to take into account that it's not a desirable outcome for children to only accept people that they know really well online, more so for other, uh, other children or adolescents. So a balance is required, privacy autonomy, as I told you, I think we think that it should always be embedded in these issues. And while in some countries it's the case, in others it's not. In Latin America, it depends on the like political orientation of, of governments or the actual people who are in, in charge of, of children policies. And I think we need, we, we need to, to have better discussions, Pol political also on social media, because these, these things tend to be a lot on social media. So just to finish uh, this presentation, I will also uh, quote this uh, Leo Lagos, the, the journalist, that I think he summed up the, the, main, argu the main argument or the, the main message of the, of the paper, of, also the presentation really good. Also, I will translate from Spanish. Uh, perhaps instead of teach fear to, to going through the woods or the cyber woods, uh, perhaps we better teach our little Red Riding Hoods and also their grandmothers that ways to be able to detect and cope with the SIP. Obviously, we need to teach them that they, 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 may, they need to be able to move through the woods without a risk of harms and more important, without fear. And that's the, the thing about uh, being afraid. It's not, even if you are taking safer, safetier measures. If you are afraid, that's afraid. That's not a desirable outcome. Lead like uh, Querida Caperucita, the, the danger is not only perhaps the wolf. The, 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 what's really dangerous, bravo, it's to teach you fear and impede, like forbid you to, to, to be what, whatever you want to be and, uh, and, don't, and, and forbidding you to understand that what you uh, find in the, in the forest can be something really good, attractive and relevant for you. I think that sums up uh, actually really, really good the, the main argument of the presentation uh, on the paper. You can find the references, the complete list on the paper. And also this is a reference to the, to the article on a local uh, newspaper. And thank you very much. Thank you, Matias. Uh, this was a fantastic presentation. Thank you for the clarity in presenting uh, the argument, uh, the methods, and also the results. Um, I had so many questions. Um, I would like also to encourage the audience to ask their questions. You have the Q&A button uh, uh, below in the in a feature in Zoom. But um, I would like to start asking uh, probably the first question. And it's about uh, if you had, if you have thoughts or or how we can like um, understand how this idea of friend request um, may change depending on the type of platform that uh, kids are using. Because I was particularly thinking in gaming, uh, which is like an activity very frequent uh, in part in those uh, in those kids, and I was thinking in how like this idea of identity that maybe in Facebook or in other or Instagram, you have like uh, the profile picture and, the, and a name display. And sometimes in other um, platforms, this identity is more blur, I would say. So I don't know if you measure this with a particular platform or what your thoughts on that? That's a really good question. Uh, the thing is with this kind of catch-all service, Kids online, even if it's regarding like what children do online, it's a catch-all survey, and we need to prioritize certain questions. As I show you, not every country asks this, uh, like how do you reply or respond to to requests. And the only thing that the, in Uruguay we filter is if they have social media accounts. But we didn't differentiate between games and another platforms. I think some of the responses might change depending on platform, the question is as a whole, and this, this is a, weak, uh, a weakness of the, the way we frame the question. 
but I think that you are completely right. It's it's completely different when you are anonymous, or at least you have a, like a, a username, and it's different when you have like your personal information uh, on, on the both sides because you, you have more information about the requester. And yes, if in a setting where everyone puts like really or at least somewhat very following information and requester doesn't, it's like a, 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 not, a, a not good sign to accept the, the friendship. But in the other settings where it's more like you, you are a, a character or playing a, like a shooter or a MOBA, it's different. But perhaps the types of, of, uh, of types that are created are different. I think th there are a lot of risks, for example, we didn't discuss other types of risks like, um, for example, radicalization, they do happen. This is in Latin America, people tend to think about more strange or danger in, in the more traditional sense, like the white ban uh, and these kind of things. But there are all risks that uh, I read some studies that in certain online games are more prevalent. Uh, but the thing is, I think the, the, we need to further study this, I agree with you, which uh, the thing is, uh, it's our, I, 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 sorry, how do you say in English? There are not a lot of people studying this. There are most people speaking of this on the media. And this is problematic because, uh, for example, Kids Online is a really expensive survey, like really, really expensive. It's like close to 50K if you take into account uh, dollars, uh, American dollars. Uh, everything because also when you need to do advocacy and but I think only the service like it's really expensive but when like not specialized journalists interview you I had an experience where they put our data like with other like psychologists that for example he went to schools and asked children in the schools that he gave some lectures what they feel uh, for, and it was the same like they, they were equal in in quality so it's problematic but I think we need more qualitative studies. Chernikova's paper is amazing. I really recommend this. It's for European teens. It's what, what, what we have, but I think we, we require more studies. And as you say, different settings, I see the digital ecology in which children live is really important. And perhaps, and there are some studies on like different like presences in the, for adults. I, I, I think I read the last month how people manage to behave differently in LinkedIn compared to Facebook and compared to, we need some of this for children because uh, it, it's difficult to study children on this, also smaller children. Kids Online doesn't go like uh, before nine because there's difficult to comprehend these kind of questions. But yes, I completely agree. It's, uh, I encourage everyone, I am really hopeful. I, I will collaborate to study this in different settings. Yeah, uh, yeah, I totally agree. I, I also was thinking um, in terms of uh, how um, we are measuring this uh, uh, by asking uh, kids about like, okay, uh, you have accepted or you don't accept it, this friend. But I was also thinking that uh, probably this is more like a Latin American culture that, but probably is extended, I don't know. But the idea, like we all were raised with, um, with uh, the common saying of, you don't talk with strangers, probably. <laughs> so uh, how we take in, con in consideration these probably social slash disability uh, in those children that probably they were raised uh, saying that you, don't sh you shouldn't speak with stranger. And I was thinking probably in, 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 your, um, in your encouragement to, to continue exploring this, um, uh, this in other settings, in other methodologies, how we can like, combine these like uh, survey methods, uh, experience with probably analyzing the current uh, uh, networks of uh, those kids in which, okay, you say that, but how they are um, actually accepting or interacting with, with people. Um, I have <coughs> a, a, another question that uh, is related also with uh, the methods and, uh, and is if uh, you take uh, sorry, if, if the survey take into account, took into account uh, the digital skills of the parents of those uh, kids and how these uh, shape in some way, if any way, uh, how like kids uh, act uh, in relation to friend requests? Okay, it's a really interesting question. As I, as I said, like this is a, 
a catch-all survey and, and we actually wanted to make a cleaner model to, to present this a, a very small but clean argument. But yes, the, we are currently working in the cases Costa Rica, Chile, and Uruguay, not on this, but for example, on creative skills for children. And we actually, we, we ask the same set of visual skills to the guardian and to the child. And uh, in the, for example, in the case of not this, but uh, creating something online, the skill of the parent has a really like, is one of the strongest predictors. In this case, we probably should have included some mediation, more than skills, some mediation strategy. The thing is, they interacted, like there's a strong interaction with age and the, the more variables we include in the model, in the other velocity regression, the less we were sure that the regression uh, completed, that, that, that assumptions were correct. So we, we opted for this, but yes, the parent and digital skills level, also it, it's also, it's highly correlated with SES. So we kind of included a, like a, a proxy for that. We could include digital skills, what we know is that uh, there's a link between parents' digital skills and some styles of mediation, of digital mediation. And probably like, I think if, if, we, I wanted, if we wanted to improve this, like to work on this paper and the next step, I think it, we will need to assess how mediation interacts or at least moderates these, these other variables. Like this children digital skills level, age, uh, I think it's more like econometric than psychometric, more complex, because as this kind of things, we like one K cases, it's okay. But if you start adding variables, the, the model makes it more complex. But I think, yes, you, you, you completely agree. I think parents' digital skills are like a, a key component, but also they interact with the parental styles. I think I will recommend the, the new book of Sonia Livingstone and I know parenting in the digital, for digital future that kind of asks these kind of things for, it's more qualitative study, it's for the UK, but kind of delves into these kind of things, also how inequalities interact with, with this. I, I think it has to do with parenting digital skills, but also with parenting styles. It, it, it's broader than digital. It's uh, what you said, like stranger danger, don't speak with stranger, don't take candies from stranger. I still believe that don't take it, don't take a, can, a candy from a stranger. It's a really good uh, advice. The same in the internet, don't go inside a white van with a stranger. It's also a really, a really good safety trip. But the thing is when we think about stranger, by default, we think about this dangerous stranger. I, I discussed with my students and when you go like to, to I don't know how you say in English, to dance to a pub, you are actually talking with, with strangers face to face without the internet. And they can or cannot, they, they can be, they could be lying to you the same as someone could be lying to you online. It's a social interaction issue, not a CMC. People who study CMC, actually there are settings in which like not lying, but at least exaggerating is, it's more common than others. And if you can verify you, the data there are people is providing you, it's less, it's less probable, but it's still a social interaction problem, not only a digital one. Uh, and Latinos, we tend to be, we tend to use more good in like tend to use more social media. Now everyone uses, but we have some things that are different. And perhaps another step is to compare Latin American results with Asian or or like North American or European. And, probably to see if uh, they are similar as a whole or there are more like Latin responses. Excellent. Uh, we have a question uh, in the Q&A and probably we'll have to rush in answering uh, in probably two minutes. Uh, but it is a very good question from Lucia Weinberg. Uh, she said, do you have any sense on whether this has changed in the pandemic? Are kids more willing to communicate with strangers? It's a really good question. The problem is that we don't have a, a good answer because we don't have like how to compare like the study we con like for example Republic Dominican Republic only has a study during the pandemic and not before and we have only studies before and not during Brazil is going to present some findings of the kids online but they don't ask a lot of things they do an like, annual service on the country in the world that does kids online every year but they don't ask all the questions and like a uh, educated guest. Perhaps yes, if you're alone in your house and 
uh, you, you will are more prone to social contacts. But I think it depends on parenting styles. If parenting, for example, during the pandemic, forbid their children to do any kind of social contact and uh, limited like the time, the time and screen time this is a horrible concept like to measure, but the limited screen time, uh, children, as I think it's reasonable to assume that as soon as they have any social, any way to make a new social contact, they will jump into it. But as with physic the physical world, you don't go with your like 40 year children to the street and say, oh, let's go, go to your school alone. You first go with them, you teach them how to behave and you kind of give them progressive autonomy. And I think that's the issue. And we need to study more parenting styles, these moral panics, how do they affect parents? And yes, we need to have like comparative studies before, during and after the pandemic. Because I think things will change and we are not like doing like the, min the very minimum of research for kids that we need to do. Thank you very much, Matias, for a great presentation and a great uh, Q&A session. Thank you, Facundo, for always terrific moderation. Thank you, our all of you in the audience, for staying with us to the end. And I want to invite everybody to join us next week for a seminar by Carmen Gonzalez at the University of Washington. And once again, on behalf of the Center for Latinx Digital Media, thank you for being part of our events. And I wish everybody a great rest of your week. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you, everyone.